Hello and most welcome everyone to Heidegger 1086 and today I will continue with Heraclitus. I'm really happy about the text from Charles, Charles S. Kahn. I see many similarities in what I'm trying to convey when it comes to quantum mechanics. Many people seem to think that there are no rules in quantum mechanics. Uh, whether it's, it's true that there are no rules like the ones in classical physics. Um, quantum mechanics is in itself a questioning in the workings of the rule of, of classical physics. And it is not unfair to say that the conclusion of quantum mechanics is that the rules in classical physics are arbitrary and random. They don't give anything. And this is of course the reason for the discussion in the lecture hall with Auge Bohr, the son of the founder of quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr, who shouted at his doctorates, do not use the word existence. The reason for that is existence is in itself a nothing. Nothing that we can use effectively. It's a myth. It has, of course, a philosophical history, but it's not of the real. And I think that is very important to understand. We do not lose anything. We're trying to remember that. We don't lose anything when we enter quantum mechanics. We gain knowledge, we get rules, and this is very close to what Heraclitus is talking about when he mentions the Apeiron. This is where there are limits, borders, true beginnings and true endings. That is not possible in classical physics. The book from Charles H. Kahn tries to show that in Heraclitus there are quite clear rules and as it was mid misunderstood already at the in session of Heraclitus is so-called can you call it parodical entering of the Miletians to show that thesis in itself could not vouch for reality. That criticism or that parody or that deconstruction, call it maybe, is the same that is festering all today. We think somehow that we can get rid of language and just have physics, the natural world, and the only purpose of language is to convey what is, in, what is in the natural world. Language itself doesn't have any purpose. It's meaningless, it's arbitrary. These are like arbitrary signs, as Saussure said, only terms. I would say, if you enter into that thinking, you have abandon everything. Language is more important than the construction thesis. First, thesis is a rather new thing. It did not exist before the Miletians. There was not such a thing as thesis among the Babylonians, Assyrians, nor did the Persians engage in thesis. Heraclitus, that's the second thing, already understood that physics could be a trap, something to end in, and it could lead to the argumentation that languages are just terms. What they are pointing to are, is the most important. A horrible worldview, an absolutely horrible worldview. 
it reduces everything to shrapnel and it makes all understanding impossible after that step you cannot have any understanding whatsoever that's the ridiculous view that Noam Chomsky has Saussure, Levi Straw everything can be reduced to these signs and they are arbitrary <coughs> I continue on page 89 here the intimate connection between linguistic form and intellectual content of his discourse will be the primary object of my commentary so writes Charles Kahn. In order to elucidate this relationship between literary structure and philosophical thought, I make use of three assumptions, two of which are fundamental for my interpretation, while the third is perhaps only a device of expository convenience. The fundamental principle are what I call the linguistic density of the individual fragments and the resonance between them. The third more optional principle is a meaningful arrangement for the fragments as in the ordering imposed here. As, what no as was noted earlier, this third principle is itself twofold. One, I assume that the original order was a meaningful one and two, I assume that the order I have chosen is true to Heraclitus' own meaning. Some reasons in favour of the first of these two assumptions were given in the general introduction. The second assumption cannot be defended by any argument. It is justified only by its utility to the extent that it makes Heraclitus easier to read and interpret. But this principle of arrangement is not only conjectural and controversial, it also turns out to be dispensable in the sense that anyone who accepts the other two principles, linguistic density and resonance, may reach the same overall interpretation of Heraclitus without attaching any particular importance to the order in which the fragments are to be read. By linguistic density I mean the phenomenon by which a multiplicity of ideas are expressed in a single word or phrase. By resonance I mean a relationship between fragments by which a single verbal theme or image is echoed from one text to another in such a way that the meaning of each is enriched when they are understood together. These two principles are formally complementary. Resonance is one factor making for the density of any particular text. And conversely, it is because of the density of the text that resonance is possible and, of course, meaningful. This complementary can be more precisely expressed in terms of sign and signified, if by sign we mean the individual occurrence of a word or a phrase in a particular text, and by signified we mean an idea, image or verbal theme that may appear in different texts. Then density is one many relationship between sign and signified, while resonance is a man, many one relation between different texts and a single image of theme. So after that repetition I continue with the text and now I have gone to page 19. But of course they will in any case be arranged in some order and whatever, whatever that order may be 
the phenomenon of resonance, in this case between the four occurrences of Sophon, will give rise to a linear effect which is like that of Anne Lebeck called prolepsis, in which he illustrated in detail for Aeschylus Orestio, where the linear order is independently known. The form which repetition or recurrence takes in the Orestia is that of proleptic introduction and gradual development. The word prolepsis here denotes a brief initial statement of several major themes on block. It is in its early occurrences the image is elliptical and enigmatic. It is griefos or riddle whose solution is strung out over the course of the individual drama or the entire trial tri trilogy. Significance increases with repetition. The image gains in clarity as the action moves to climax. Prolepsis and gradual development of recurrent imagery, along with the corollary movement from enigmatic utterance to clear statement, from riddle to solution, dominate the structure of the Oristia. My arrangement of the fragments is inspired by the assumption that a similar movement dominates the structure of Heraclitus's own exposition. Thus I have placed first the most enigmatic reference to what is wise and I reserve for the climax his more solemn and decisive announcement of the wise alone. But however they are arranged the four fragments on the theme of Sophon will reinforce it on, on another. The earlier occurrences will prepare the reader for the later ones, which in turn will cast some light back on what precedes. Thus the effect of prolepsis in some form as a consequence of resonance over a linear text is independent of any particular arrangement of the fragments. My arrangement of the fragments is inspired by the assumption that a similar movement dominates the structures of Heraclitus' own exposition. Thus I have placed first the most enigmatic reference to what is wise, and I have reserved for the climax his more solemn and decisive announcement of the wise one alone. But however they are arranged, the four fragments on the theme of Sophon will reinforce one another. The earlier occurrences will prepare the reader for the later ones, which in turn will cast some light back on what precedes. Thus the effect of prolepsis in some form as a consequence of resonance over a linear text is independent of any particular arrangements of the fragments. The other principle of linguistic density within a given text is essentially the phenomena of meaningful ambigu ambiguity. The use of lexical and syntactic indeterminacy indeterminacy as a device for saying several things at once. It will often be convenient to speak of deliberate or intentional ambiguity. ambiguity. I think these expressions are harmless and justified as long as it is clearly understood that they ha there is no external biographical ex evidence for imparting such intentions to Heraclitus. For these expressions simply reflect the fact that we can construe an ambiguid 
ambiguity in the text as meaningful only if we perceive it as a sign of the author's intention to communicate to us some complex thought. Linguistic density in this sense bears a certain form of resemblance to the deliberate ambiguity of the Delphic oracle, to which Heraclitus himself alludes. But the semantic structure of the two cases is fundamentally different. In an oracle like, if Croesus makes war on Cyrus, he will destroy a great kingdom. The ambiguity the ambiguity, namely whose kingdom, is certainly calculated. But after the event there can be no doubt as to what would have been the correct interpretation. The task of understanding an oracle consists in rejecting various possibilities and selecting the one appropriate message. With meaningful ambiguity in poetic discourse, however, there can be no single interpretation that is alone correct. The meaning is essentially multiple and complex. In the process of interpreting a text, we may consider and discard some senses as inappropriate but we will be left with an irreducible residue of at least two partially significant interpretations. Two distinct statements to be understood as intended by the author if the ambiguity itself is artistically meaningful. That is to say to the stylistic device of polysemy or multivocity on the part of the author must correspond a principle of hermeneutical generosity on the part of the reader and the commentator. This principle, which has been taken for granted in literary criticism for some time, has unfortunately been neglected in the more austere proceedings of classical scholarship. As a result, a good deal of scholarly effort have, has been devoted to eliminating multiplicity of meaning and thus impoverishing the semantic content of the text by defending a single construal to the exclusion of others, in the case of Heraclitus as in that of Aeschylus. The interpreter's task is to preserve the original richness of significance by admitting a plurality of alternative senses, some obvious, others recondite, some superficial, others profound. Such discourse presupposes an art of reading which classical scholars seem to have lost, though they are beginning to rediscover it in recent studies of Aeschylus. Borrowing a term from contemporary linguistics, I shall say that a given text admits several different readings, where the readings differ from one another by imposing alternative syntactical combinations on the text or by taking the same word in different senses. I shall first describe my procedure for analyzing linguistic density in general terms and then illustrate it by an application to the first sentence of Heraclitus's book.
I count as primary reading for text the interpretation that seems most natural, most likely to recommend itself on first reading. One or more secondary readings may be required either to resolve problems raised by the primary reading, as in the case of our first example below, to take account of echi vocal words or constructions, to bring out connections of language or imagery between this text and other fragments. In the latter case, the phenomena of density and resonance will coincide. In establishing the primary reading, it will be important to know not only the linguistic expectations created by early literature, but also the normal usage of the words in Ionic prose. Their ordinary meaning for Heraclitus' original audience. To this end, our best guide will be the usage of Herodotus, where the evidence is abundant of relatively early date and beautifully analyzed in Powell's lexicon to Herodotus, the only substantial body of surviving prose that is older than Herodotus is precisely our material from Heraclitus. Turning now to the first sentence of the book, we seek a primary reading for the first three words. Tu logo tu de. This logos here. On the basis of evidence to be presented in the preliminary remark on this fragment, we can be sure that an original reader of the book would have understood this phrase as a conventional self-reference. An introduction to the work itself. This discourse which I am presenting and which you are about to read. But the next two words, eontos aei, being forever, confront us with a dilemma that has plagued readers since Aristotle's and has been the subject of endless dispute among modern commentators. A dispute which I suggest can only be resolved if we are prepared to regard ambiguity, ambiguity not as a blemish to be elimi elimi eliminated, but as a meaningful stylistic device to be accepted and understood. What Aristotle noticed in one of his rare comments on another philosopher's style was that the word ae, always, forever, in this opening sentence can be construed either with the words that precede, this is logos forever, or with those that follow, man always fail to comprehend. Aristotle offers no opinion on the construction beyond the appropriate remark that such ambiguity makes Heraclitus hard to read. But modern scholars have felt obliged to take sides, either in favour of the former construction, which was long predominant and has been defended recent, recently by Gigong, Verdenius, Frankel, Guffrey and West, or in favour of the latter, which was heard by Reinhardt, Snell, Kirk, Markovic and Bolak Wisman, among others. What this division of opinion shows is that, as Aristotle observed, there is, no, there is good reason to take the adverb both ways. The primary most natural construal will take i.e. with what precedes for two reasons. One, this construction will become visible first because what precedes it is presented first. And two, the verb is is, eontos, is generally used as a copula, 
with some other terms as predicate or complement. In Greek, as in English, a phrase like although this logos is lends us to expect yet to expect another word or phrase before the end of the clause. Before we punctuate diastixia, as Aristotle put it, and so in the parallel clauses in 3D2, although the logos is shared, the difference is that in Greek, but not normally in English, these expectations may be mistaken, and the verb is turn out itself to constitute constitute the predicate. This possibility will be exploited in our second reading. On first reading, however, I punctuate after IE and construe this logos is forever or is always. Now being forever, Aeontis Ae is a standard Homeric phrase for the immortal gods who are everlasting or who live forever when the primary senses of Logos and Is Forever are combined, they give This discourse is forever alive, is immortal. A reading on the face of it so strange that it obliges us to go deeper. But although this first interpretation is puzzling, it is not necessarily mistaken. On the contrary, its correctness as a, at a deeper level is confirmed by a phenomenon of resonance. The parallel term aezun, ever living, is applied to fire, together with the phrase na, it was forever, in an emphatic and syntactically ambiguous triple occurrence of the verb to be. Thus the logos of Heraclitus, though not itself definitely identified as an eternal principle, is presented from the very beginning in such a way as to provide a suggestion of everlasting life. But this idea is best a hyp hyponoia here, a mysterious hint of a thought not fully expressed. We want something to be said about the logos that is appropriate to stretch of discourse, and in this connection the Homeric formula for immortality will not do. Thus, our primary reading collapses under its own weight. A second reading will take account of the fact that we can punctuate before AE and construe the adverb with what follows. Man always failed to comprehend. This leaves the verb is iontos without any predicate or complement in the initial clause. Although this logos is, we can make sense of that by appealing to what I have called the word veridical use of the verb, where esti or eon means is true, is so, ho eon logos will be the true report. an account which states the fact. The sentence now becomes, although this logos is true, men are forever incapable of understanding it. In translating the sentence, I have tried to suggest both readings, but no rendering can do justice to the fact that a reader who wishes to avoid an arbitrary decision will be left in genuine suspense between the more natural reading of the first clause, this logos is forever, which has a proper literary ring to it, but leaves us wondering just what that could mean.
and the reading this logos is true which is stylistically more recherche but clear even banal in its content when both readings have a good case to be made for them it is important to leave open the possibility that the difficulty of deciding between them is itself the intended effect how great and once we have understood Heraclitus' thought as a whole, we see why this initial perplexity is significant. For the Logos of Heraclitus is not merely his statement. It is the eternal structure of the world as it manifests itself in discourse. This will be hinted at in the next words. Men fail to comprehend even before they have heard what I have to say. further indicated by the diverse usage of logos throughout the fragments and most strikingly in the contrast between listening to me and listening to the logos. Thus we have two plausible and instructive readings of the first sentence corresponding to alternative construals of the verb ae and it is the primary more natural reading this logos is forever that is from the point of view of content the deeper and more paradoxical the reading which is secondary or artificial in stylistic, stylistic terms this logos is true is more unsurprising even banal in terms of content so the relation between the surface meaning and the hyponoia or deeper sense is itself unstable and complex. The result is a prose style which fully justifies Heraclitus' reputation as the obscure or Scotinus. The, the effect of initial encounter is preserved for us in the anecdote of Socrates' response, when Euripides asked him what he thought of the, of the book. <clears throat> what I understand is excellent and I think the rest is also, but it takes a Delian diver to get to the bottom of it. An eloquent epigram preserved by Diogenes warns the reader not to peruse the book too rapidly. It is hard, it is a hard road filled with darkness and gloom, but if an initiate leads you on the way, it becomes brighter than the radiance of the sun. I make no claims to reach such dazzling clarity here. But I do believe, with Deals and others, that the longer one reflects upon these fragments, the clearer becomes the unity, complexity and profundity of the thought they convey. In conclusion, I want to emphasize that my procedure of recognizing two or more distinct readings is only a hermeneutical device for clarifying the semantic density of the text. Such devices are legitimate and necessary and they require no apology but they need not blind us to the fact that there is no natural unit for counting the meanings of a given text one might reasonably claim that all of Heraclitus's fragments have only one single meaning which is in fact the full semantic structure of his thought as a whole of which any given phrase is but an incomplete fragment. Our piecemeal readings of particular phrases or sentences are best regarded as workmanlike tools for apprehending and reconstructing this global meaning as a kind of ladder or crutch to be abandoned once the goal of understanding has been achieved. Now I go further to the 
comments here. One. Preliminary remark on fragment one. Fragment one is the longest quotation from Heraclitus and probably the longest piece of surviving Greek prose before the histories of Herodotus, which it antedates by 50 years. It is in turn some 50 years younger than the earliest known prose work, the, the little book of Anaximander, from which we have one quotation. As this quotation from Anaximander and the nearly contemporary citations from Pheresides show, and as the fragments of Heraclitus and the long narrative of Herodotus confirm, Ionic prose came into being as a highly developed literary form, for it could from the start draw upon the rich resources of the two centuries of written epic and lyric poetry beginning with the Iliad in the 8th century and of course the Iliad in turn could be drawn upon a long tradition of oral poetry. Thus the high liter literary level of early Greek prose is not itself surprising. What is surprising is the extraordinarily dense and personal style of the quotations from Heraclitus. As we can see from other early samples, Greek prose was, at first, employed primarily for the publication of Ionian history, for presenting the result of systematic inquiry or research on a variety of subjects, from astronomy to biology, including historical research in connection with the description of lands and peoples, as in the travel book of Hecateus a Milesian contemporary of Heraclitus. The old Ionic term Historia soon became fixed in its narrow application to history in our sense, because it was this type of investigation that first gave birth to major works of prose literature the histories of Herodotus and Phocides, uh, we can form some picture of the earlier Ionian books from what remains of Hecateus, Anaxagoras and Diogenes of Apollonia, as well as from the older Hippocratic treatises. From such evidence we know that when Heraclitus begins his proem with reference to his own logos, he is following a literary tradition well established among early prose authors. The oldest surviving parallel is the preamble to the work of Hecateus, the Historia or the Genealogia, which began with these words. Hecateus of Miletus says as follows, I write these things as they seem to me to be true, for the reports Logoi of the Greeks are, in my judgment, many and ridiculous. The 5th century treatise of Ion of Chios begins, the starting point of my discourse Logos, all things are free and nothing more or less than these free. Other examples show that such treatises were regularly introduced by reference to the Logos or discourse as such. But if this self-reference is a traditional feature in the proem, what is not traditional at all is the, the peculiar emphasis on the term Logos and the syntactic ambiguities by which it is surrounded. The stylistic difficulties here suggest that if Heraclitus Logos is from one point of view the usual Ionian prose report, it is also something quite different. <coughs> Heraclitus presumably chose to write in prose because that was the new scientific language of his day, 
and the traditional idiom of aphoristic wisdom. But whereas the general tendency of Ionian prose is toward directness and clarity of expression, the distinctive trait of Heraclitus' own style is more than Delphic delight in paradox, enigma, and equivocation. In this respect, the little book of Heraclitus will have been very atypical representative of the new genre. A reader who began to began by expecting a straightforward report of scientific research or speculation would be brought up short by the grammatical dilemma confronting him in the first sentence. For convenience of reference, I number the three sentences of the first fragment and consider them one by them, one by one. Number one. Although this account Logos holds forever, men ever fail to comprehend, both before hearing it and once they have heard. Both Aristotle and Sectus tell us this passage came at the beginning of the book. As we have seen, the initial, initial ambiguity in the syntax of A.E. forever hints at the deeper ambivalence in the statues of Heraclitus Logos. It is both his discourse and something more, something universal. All things occur in agreement with it even eternal and divine, aeon ae, precisely in virtue of the fact that it is common or shared by all, sinos. This first sentence sounds the twin themes of hearing and comprehending that will recur with increasing significance throughout the fragments. The complaint that his auditors are unable to comprehend is a natural one on the part of an author who has chosen the language of enigma and equivocation. What is more puzzling is the insistence that men prove uncomprehending not only once they have heard my discourse, but even before. How can they be expected to understand it in advance? This will make sense only if Heraclitus Logos represents a truth that has been there all along. If, like fire, it always was, is and will be. Thus the Logos here cannot be just what Heraclitus says, not merely the words he utters or even the meaning of what he has to say if meaning is understood subjectively as what the speaker has in mind or his intentions in speaking. The Logos can be his meaning only in the objective sense, the structure which his word intend or point at, which is, which is the structure of the world itself and not the intentional structure of his thought about the world. Only such an objective structure can be forever available for comprehension before any word are uttered. Which is not to say that we can translate Logos by structure or by the objective content of my discourse. The tension between word and content is essential here, for without it we do not have the instructive paradox of men who are expected to understand a logos they have never heard. Second fragment. Although all things come to pass in accordance with this account, logos, men are like the untried when they try such words and work as I set forth, distinguishing each according to its nature, physis, and telling how it is. The second sentence be begins with a clause in the genitive case that echoes not only the syntax but also the vocabulary of the beginning. The verb ginestai, become, come to pass, which first expressed man's lack of comprehension, is here applied to all the things that there are.
Ginomenon Panton, and that man failed to comprehend the genitival construction which first depended upon Axinetoi, unable to comprehend, is now connected with the Apeiroi, lacking in experience. The formal parallels between these two sentences suggest that Heraclitus is developing a single point. In both cases, the announcement of the Logos and its universal truth in the genitival clause is contrasted with the incompetent response of mankind in the principal clause. The tension between the two aspects of Logos, the actual word of Heraclitus, and their everlasting content is stretched still further here, where the Logos as universal law is juxtaposed with Heraclitus' reference to his own exposition in the emphatic first person, Hokoion ego diogome, such as I set forth. They are like the untried, they resemble men without experience, is a surprising phrase, for it suggests that in fact men do have the experience in question. And well they might, since it is the experience of things that occur according to the Logos. And these are all things, no one can be without such an experience. But it's difficult for man to grasp this truth, even when Heraclitus announces it to them directly. They can make nothing of this word epia, nor of the facts erga, which he points out, although he tells it like it is and puts each thing in place according to physics. The word for facts, erga, works deed, has an epic overtones. It may refer to heroic exploits and also to more humble labor, as in the Hesiod's works and days. The term physis, on the other hand, for the genuine nature or structure of a thing, is the watchword of the new natural philosophy that radiates from Miletus. By the use of this characteristic word, which recurs in 10 and in 22, as by his use of history, inquiry, and cosmos in the sense of world order. Heraclitus expressly claims infinity with the new scientific tradition and thus offer his own truths as a supplement or a rival to that of natural philosophers. The point he makes is similar to the one made by Douglas Hofstadter in Gödel Escherbach. It shows that Gödel and Hilbert they tried to do something that didn't work. And that is to reduce mathematics to one single referent, to something out there, something transcendental. We try to do the same with language and saying that the words themselves are not important. It is what they mean that is important. And I would say that is an incredible mistake. It's a horrible, nasty, obfuscating, distasteful, but also devastating. Because that reduces language. It do the same to language as Gould tried to do to mathematics. Kill it off. And when he didn't manage to kill it off, both Gödel and Hilbert and at least 50 other mathematicians ended up in eternal depressions. This is what we want, and when we don't get it, we get obstinately depressed. I would say there is no need for that depression. The very depressive would be to believe too much in the Milesian physics that there is a world there, out there, and it's reductible, and the words do not matter. Language is everything, we are completely lost without it. And reducing language to pure meanings is absolutely horrible. So Sir should be incredibly ashamed of himself to say that words are random. It's a horrible accusation and it's anti-intellectual because in the end 
he takes away everything that is nice and fine. And I would say Sosiris, the predecessor of this emperor of the left hemisphere, because the left hemisphere does only do representations. And for the left hemisphere, words are just simply pointers to an external extern externality. And for the left hemisphere, contradictions are in the world, not in language. And not something good. Actually, they should get rid of, get, be gotten rid of. There is no random incidence uh, that when you are dominated by the left hemisphere, you will always ask what the word mean or what the saying mean. In other words, this is the reduction girl tried to do, to do, reduce everything to a few axioms. He showed it will not work, it will never ever work. But if it worked, it would have been absolutely horrible. And we're trying all to do that, reducing language beyond belief, destroying the greatest gift to humanity ever. And today it is especially academia who is doing the crusade against ourselves. An autoimmune reaction where we try to dis destroy the fountain of all good. All words are different. There is not a singular word that is similar. They all have their pronouncement, they all have their place, and they are not replaceable by anything. It is the several meanings that they carry that makes it possible for humans to be humans. Without language we are no longer human beings. We are just dwellers in the platonic cave. And I say thank you very much and have a very pleasant afternoon. Bye bye for now.